In this video, I host a panel on the topic of contact with non-human intelligence. Included is UFO historian Richard Dolan, James Ian Doley of Engaging the Phenomenon, and Jay King of the Experiencer Group. Now, let's dive in. Welcome to the, I guess, the end of contact week. And James Ian Doley came up with the idea. And it was from the 12th to the 18th. And I know, James, you've been having many videos on this topic, and that's been great. And so I guess I'll start the panel with a question. So as we all know, Julian, uh, the Gillibrand Rubio Amendment is about to pass. It's, it's, it's supposed to pass before Christmas. And there's a lot of provisions in that amendment that are going to take us to a new phase as it, as it pertains to UAP, whether it's the scientific plan for studying and coming up with theories as to how UAP operate or the rapid response team that's going to be constructed for actual people to go out into the field quickly when there's been UAP reports. They're asking for information on UAP encounters uh, in proximity of nuclear facilities. They're asking for any information on biological effects people have had when they've encountered UAP, there's even going to be a coordination amongst allies to discuss this issue. And they're even asking for any information on exploitation of UAP suggesting crash retrievals. So this is a pretty big deal. So my, my, my question is, it, since December 16, 2017, when the New York Times article was published, I think collectively, journalistically, we've been mostly focusing on the, the technology itself. But right before the Gillibrand Amendment passes and going into that new phase of, of this process that has been ensuing for the past four years, when do you think the question is going to become more central of who exactly is behind the wheel of this technology? And I'll, I'll give this to Richard Dolan first. Oh, all right. Well, thank you. Thanks, Robbie. Um, the th weird thing is, I think you hit the exactly correct point. It's like in the last four years, we were so thrilled and excited that we got any kind of love at all from the media, any kind of acknowledgement of the UFO reality that we were, and I think really easily guided into this conversation about, oh, well, what else does the Navy have? And are we going to have disclosure? And, you know, and, and that's all that's important. But a lot of things have gotten lost in the shuffle. Uh, one is the deep, deep nature of the cover-up, things like crash retrievals and the like. But the other, which you're referring to, is contact. I mean, that just gets completely uh, brushed aside, it seems to me. And there, it's so important. And you know, we're we're dealing. We it's easy for us to forget we are dealing with a, an intelligence that is operating here. Whether whether they have intentions that we would consider good or not, we don't really know for sure, but they're doing everything they are by stealth, and they are definitely having a major impact on our society, if covertly, and we don't have any conversation about this whatsoever. So that's a, that's a discussion that needs to happen in a broader context. I mean, UFO researchers talk about it enough, but the broader public, the general public is just not there yet, and it, it would be a good idea to get people there. What about you, James? When do you think this is going to enter the zeitgeist and the conversation? Because I, I just don't think the Gillibrand Rubio Amendment passing can do so without elevating this topic into the mainstream. It, it, you know, the, it, I've heard that there's going to be more 60 minute segments on this issue. And when the NDA finally gets signed by Joe Biden, I think there'll be an onslaught of new coverage because this 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 new office might be funded over a billion dollars. Some have speculated that it will reach into that territory. And that's it's inevitable that the UFO topic has to become more saturated in our conversation. So when do you think, James, the 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 issue of who's behind the wheel will take greater priority in the discussion journalistically and otherwise? Yeah, I think for the, the mainstream conversation to get there, we still have, I think I think it's still the reality, the UFO reality is still sinking in for people, uh, the general public. 
you know, you still see um, people debunking and, and, and being skeptical to the extent where it's still pretty silly. And um, I mean, again, the, the contact uh, question, right? The idea of contact, I think those are some of the most fundamental questions that people have about the UFO phenomenon, even, even um, people not into the subject. I think their, their genuine curiosity is like, okay, if UFOs are real, um, you know, wh- who are they? What are they doing here? Um, and, and that kind of thing. What are their, their intentions? So I think, uh, I think it has a way to go uh, to, to be in the mainstream thing. I think we're going to see probably articles uh, that address it here and there, but I think we're still, we're still in a way codependent in, in a way for the, for that kind of disclosure moment. I think when there's like an official disclosure and I, I hate to say that because, you know, what's out there is already in, in my opinion, enough for any rational thinking person to say, okay, uh, UFOs are real, but I, I still don't think that has completely clicked with the world um, where you have somebody like Neil deGrasse Tyson uh, you know, coming out and just dismissing it completely. But then again, you have people like Michio Kaku, who's super supportive of it, and he's asking the right questions and 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 using the right frameworks. Um, so, and, and kind of like, I guess, a realist perspective. I think it's going to take a while for the conversation to centralize there. Uh, I think we're going to see threads of it, but I don't think the conversation of contact being like a central idea is is not going to be there for a few years unless there's some kind of um, event that takes place, you know, where, you know, a whistleblower comes forward with like, you know, that's talking specifically about entities and bodies and something like, and something along those lines. I think it's going to take a big event to, to bring that to the forefront, you know, mass sighting, something like that. But even then I can see it being um, talked about for a little while. And then kind of, we're still going to go back to this, Oh, UAPs are UAPs real kind of military interaction thing. Jay, what's your take? Well, uh, thanks. And um, I really appreciate being here. I think, you know, it's, it's an amazing week to be talking about this. You know, here we are four years um, yesterday since the, that initial Leslie Kane, Ralph Blumenthal, Helene Cooper front page article in the New York times. And, you know, as as Ryan, you put it, um, the defense bill has this new UFO office. And so within four years, that's pretty amazing. But there's still so much work to do. Right. And I personally, I know of two large scale media projects that are going to be coming out in the next year that even just in and of themselves. One is from a very major news network. I'm sure some of us probably know about that project. And, you know, I, I think that that from what I've heard and from the talking heads that have been involved in some of that stuff or the contacts that have been made that way, that, that there is going to be a little bit more talk about occupants, even within this next year. Right. But that's the thing, right. In choosing to use a word like occupants, we're recognizing that there have been several waves of this already, like, you know, 50 years ago, at the end of the sixties, we had a whole, within our field, there was a whole acknowledgement. Okay. Occupants. We don't want to say aliens. We want to say occupants. Where are we going to go from there? And then by the end of the seventies, a lot of people recoiled from that. And then they wanted to kind of focus through the telescope again and get away from the idea of contact. And then, and then people like Whitley Strieber and Bud Hopkins and John Mack came along about 35 to 30 years ago. And they started bringing and they started bringing it to the fore again. Like, this is what they look like. These are these are beings. And again, you know, there was there was a squeamishness on the part of the community, uh, our community, you know, um, that that really that really kind of stymied things in a lot of ways, because there were people like Steven Spielberg that were perfectly willing way back in 1977 to say, like, look, here they are, you know, and uh, I'll make a whole movie about it, you know, whatever. And, and so I think, I think one thing that we need to get over within the situation is, is, is that is looking at a taxonomy and, and getting away from the telescope, getting away from the FLIR videos 
and getting into the cases. Richard did an amazing job with his book, The Alien Agendas, just last year in terms of saying, you know, like, here are six, here are six distinct types that I found, you know, like that are right here, right now, um, that, that there's just overwhelming anecdotal accounts of. And let's, let's go with that. Let's move through that. And I think that those kinds of taxonomies, those kinds of structures, what Richard was doing right there are incredibly important for getting people kind of through the squeamishness and, and actually into to looking at uh, like who's the there there, if that makes sense. All right. I'm going to ask kind of a weird question and see how you guys deal with it. Uh, so I've heard there's a um, Whitley Strieber's had it, had an explanation that he at one point discussed as far as I can tell um, as to why there is a cover up. He, he has stated from, from what I've heard, someone that I think is knowledgeable told me this, hopefully is correct. He has stated that according to a high ranking military officer he talked to, uh, the government used the cover, the, the cover up and the dismissal of UFOs as a way to prevent them to have a wider access to our reality. Suggestive of that, if, if the, as Stephen Bassett likes to call it, if the, if the truth embargo was removed, obviously, this topic would saturate the earth on every level, scientifically, journalistically, academically. Uh, our history books would be rewritten. Even the curriculum in our middle schools and high schools would, would be altered because obviously if we have non-human intelligence engaging our planet, that's something that's worth discussing to say the least. Do, you, do any of you think that the magnification of this topic seven plus billion of us could somehow influence the phenomenon itself to interact with us in a way that it never has previously. And I'll give that to Richard Dolan first. Wow. It's an interesting question. And I, I don't recall if I remember hearing Whitley say that I believe it. I just, um, I didn't remember that one. And by the way, thanks Jay for the shout out for my book. Appreciate that. Um, I think that, I think that there, I do believe there are multiple groups that are here, not all of which are, antithetical to our interests as a species, but I think it's very likely that at least one group is, maybe more than one. And, um, and I think they, they seem to be operating very happily clandestinely. So it is an interesting question to ask, like by opening up a public discussion, do you sort of invite them in? That seems to be the implication that I'm reading. Maybe you yeah. guys can have a different, yeah, yeah. So it's like, you give it power to enter your world. And I don't know if that's true or not, but I would say that we are really hampered by not discussing this publicly because uh, this is really, this is the biggest thing imaginable. We're now in an era where you're never supposed to believe in conspiracy theories. That's considered wrong now, but we're dealing with the grandest of all cover-ups of all time, the UFO cover-up. I can't imagine what is bigger than that. And it, it is so deeply ingrained into our society. And we're now at a point in this world where we are literally, literally looking at a global fascistic revolution, a digital turnkey totalitarian system that's, that's going on all around us. Like um, we need to be asking, like, is there any relationship whatsoever between what is going on here and the presence of these other beings? I, I don't know for sure, but like, this is important. And the fact that n not only is the alien part really not being discussed, we, we don't even really, other than a few people here and there scattered, I think, are really talking about this global totalitarian revolution, which is happening at breathtaking speed. So I think we, we've got to be getting these conversations out and we need to recognize that this is very, very difficult uh, because in, at least in the research that I've had, and I, I'm certainly not alone here, some of these beings look just like us. They look just like human beings. They may be human beings. Um, Maybe they're, maybe they're humans that work for them. I don't know what they are, but there's certainly a large number of human operators. And so that begs the obvious question, are any of them in our society? Well, you, you talk around, I know it sounds crazy to anyone who's just 
traipsing along and finds this show on YouTube, but you go to any significant UFO researcher who has been in this field for a long period of time, and they will tell you the exact same kinds of stories, that there are these human looking beings and they are integrated or integrating into our society. That doesn't have to be a bad thing. It could be a bad thing. Uh, the fact is we just aren't talking about it. Um, so there's, I, I would always vote in favor of getting this information out, talking about it openly. And it's not going to be a comfortable conversation to have because you'll immediately have a whole array of people saying you are engaging in fear mongering and you're going to be engaging in a new like Salem witch trial. Like there's the alien next door to me. Like, and indeed like that kind of craziness can happen. But what if you're in a situation where there really is uh, an un- uh, friendly infiltration that's happening. And I'm not saying that human beings are, you know, we are without our own problems. We have a lot of problems. I mean, we're almost a culture of, of insanity, but nonetheless, we do have the right to defend ourselves. And I don't know who all these beings are. And I think that it's important that we have a conversation about it. Great. How about you, James? Do you think this topic becoming more saturated in our zeitgeist will have an influence on how the phenomenon itself interacts and engages our species. Uh, yeah, I, I think so um, to a degree. I mean, I, I don't think that our participation necessarily, um, you know, either um, prevents or encourages their, um, their interaction with us. I mean, I, I don't think if like the entire world is conscious and aware of UFOs, that means that it gives them the ability to influence us more. I mean, and, and maybe sociological, sociologically, but um, I don't think it's like if, if a bunch of people become aware of UFOs, they can now enter our world and do what they will, so to speak. Um, Cause I know, I know people, uh, I believe Tom DeLong has mentioned something along those lines Um and like the kind of Collins elite ideology is where like you're given power to the demons by thinking about them. Uh, I know that is a, that actually is a real theme that comes up in some fundamentalist circles and, you know, what people would call the Collins elite. And I don't think that's the case. I think this, the, you know, whatever represents the UFO intelligence intelligence is pro probably several phenomena. Um, at least some of the groups uh, seem to do, you know, they can do as they want, <laughs> you know, regardless of our awareness of them. And, you know, they've, there's certainly probably some groups have, have been doing that for thousands of years before we even had the idea of extraterrestrials or, you know, you know, angels and demons and, and so on. So um, I do, I do think that um, they will be responsive in a sense, the UFO intelligence will be responsive to how we go forward with this. Um, and it's been mentioned before, but I, yeah, I, I think that um, some of the, some of what's going on now could very well be orchestrated and calculated by them. And that's why we've seen some of these interactions with the military and the nuclear facilities. Uh, you know, that could all be part of a, a long-term, as Richard Dolan's book goes, Alien Agenda, right? Uh, this whole thing could be orchestrated in a sense, because um, I, I don't think that they're just going around um, prodding, saying, hey, let's let's see what will happen. I think they have an idea. The UFO intelligence has an idea of what their influence is over us to the extent of when, when they interact with us. Uh, you know, I don't think they're just doing it randomly. They're just likely a purpose for it. And um, they have probably calculated for those responses. So in, in a way that is um, them, uh, I, you know, I don't want to say pushing forward disclosure, but that's, that's certainly a way of them impressing on us in, in a way that they know that we're going to respond to it, right? Um, so although I, I think it is going to have an effect, I don't, I don't think that it's, it's, um, it's given to that they, they can only uh, – interact with us if we're aware of them. I think they can do basically whatever they want at any given time. Um, but again, what going back to what Rich is saying, I think that definitely 
the more aware we are, the more open we have this discussion, the better it's going to be on our end, um, no matter what the scenario, the scenario is good or bad. I want to build on what you said, because I, a long time ago, well, a couple of years ago, I came up with an axiom. I don't have it in front of me. Something to the effect of the more advanced a civilization becomes, the less random everything they do is. And I think we, we can see that with our own civilization. And I extrapolate that. And I realize I'm being a little anthropomorphic here, but I extrapolate that and I apply it to the phenomena itself. I think that what they do probably becomes less and less random, the more sophisticated they get with artificial intelligence and various uh, technologies. Now, I recall that Ross Colthart and Luis Elizondo, both of them recently said that they have learned that the phenomena appears to become to be more brazen than it has in the past. It, it's the way it's engaging warships, for example. It is. It seems to be allowing greater opportunity for them to be seen and even uh, documented. And so there seems to be a trend here. And if, 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 as some people say, that the phenomena itself are the architects of the cover-up, then they're also the ones that are going to lead to, to a, a time when governments simply cannot uh, pretend like this doesn't exist anymore. So I do wonder if, if there is a timeline that is being initiated by the phenomena itself. And we're seeing that like in 2020, I think it was, or 2019, excuse me, there were some incursions with the USS Omaha and the USS Russell. In one incident, I think it was the Omaha, there was a spherical object, uh, no less than six feet in diameter, traveling right along with the Omaha for a complete hour, br brazenly. And then ultimately, because Jeremy Corbell released the footage, it appears as if it entered the ocean and did not destruct. I know that Corbell said that they had a submarine go look for it. They found no wreckage. So that might've been an example of a transmedium vehicle or transmedium probe. And there's no indication that any government has cracked that technology on this scale. So that might be a manifestation of the phenomenon being like, you know, we've been around a long time, but we're gonna start making it harder for governments to conceal this when maybe previously they were somehow, uh, helping governments to cover it up in some weird way. Anyways, Jay, what's your, what's your thoughts on this topic? Oh, wow. You just, you just added a, like a whole nother, like algebraic level of complexity <laughs> to the initial question, which I deeply appreciate actually. But uh, you know, I mean, a it's, it's tricky. The, 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 what Richard and James were speaking to uh, and you as well. Um, the, 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 the trickiness of of quote unquote non-human intelligence or alien intelligence that actually looks like us or could functionally be very similar to us and integrate with us. Um, that's such a challenging topic as well um, because it, it also has, has been uh, a source of stigma for many years. And it was, of course, there were some space brothers, hoaxers and things like that back in the fifties that, that spoke of human looking Venusians or whatever. Um, and, and that idea really fell out of favor so much that it's only even within the last few years, um, with recent books, um, that, 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 that seems to be something that's acceptable to speak about, you know, people don't think about how these cycles of faddishness kind of play into our preconceptions and our biases when, when it comes to the situation. Right. And you know, along those lines, an interesting thought experiment when we're talking about any other beings is like, what is their thinking like? What is their ontology like? And that's getting to your question, Ryan, where it's like, if, if as people have suggested as thought experiments, what if another civilization is a, a hundred thousand years ahead of us? What if another civilization is a million years ahead of us? What would that do? What if they've done this? this whole rollout a hundred times before, what if they've done it 500 times before, right? In different star systems or in different realities, universes, however densities, however we want to think about these, these like wild ideas. Right. And, and it's quite possible, especially when you consider that the idea that like maybe some of these beings have longer life cycles than we do. 
So when we get to a position where we say like, oh, you know, the contactees, they were saying the same thing about ecological disaster and how you guys were screwing yourselves 40 years ago. It's like, well, if some, if a being lives thought experiment, 800 years, maybe 40 years is a drop in the bucket. Maybe that doesn't mean, you know what I mean? What if that's what, it, <laughs> you know, we look at our pet dogs, they last 10 years and they look at us and they see an immortal, right? And that could be the way that we like may have to look at, at some other intelligences in terms of like the kind of frameworks, the, what is a medium term solution? What's a long term solution? What's a short term solution in, in their situation. And along those lines, when we talk about good versus bad in this kind of white black hat thing, uh, and we talk about when are they going to engage with us more? Maybe that has something more to do with when we can, when we could conceptualize just saying possibly the idea that they're just as complicated as we are. And when I think about my neighbor, you know, then the next condo over from here, I don't think of somebody that's either a white hat or a black hat. I think of a person with like complex motivations that have their own life, you know, that's like very gray, you know, no pun intended, but like somebody that, that has, their, their own lifestyle that is just adjacent to us. And so maybe that is one of the critical components in us actually having an open dialogue um, with, with these kinds of other beings, just recognizing that they might have this, a similar advanced level of complexity and complex personal motivations or cultural motivations uh, like we do. All right. I'm going to ask a question that a friend of mine gave me, and it was such a good question that I'm just going to read it word for word. I, don't, I would not have thought of it. Does the panel think abductions are dwindling or happening the same now as in previous decades? We don't see much, if any, reporting of like no recent books on abduction, only a handful of documentaries. Is this an issue with reporting or were abductions more frequent in the past than they are today? Uh, he writes, as with the contact era, we don't get Adamski's claiming visits to Venus anymore. If any of those contactees were legit, does it suggest the phenomena stopped at that sort of behavior? Does this mean abductions may have been a phase? Interest in nukes, however, seem like a permanent thing, relatively consistent through the decades. I'm going to go with Rich. What do you think of that? Uh, what, what do you, what's your take? Great question. Uh, I mean, a lot of us, we ask this question all the time, like are abductions dwindling or are they not? And it's hard for me to know, like there, <clears throat> there's, are some fairly decent or uh, at least current recent books by some of the abduction researchers. I'm thinking Barbara Lamb and Yvonne Smith for starters, and they're not the only ones that are still putting out contemporary work. I think Kathleen Martin is too, if I'm not mistaken. Um, you know, Jacob's uh, last book, Walking Among Us, is now almost a decade old, but, but those cases were not ancient either. So I'm not sure that it's really stopped. Um, however, it's worth considering there could be a good reason that abductions would be uh, diminishing, which is simply that our own, like if you were a, an alien species interested in human biology, like for reproduction, you might want more like pure, less toxified versions of people from prior generations. I mean, we've really done some horrible things. I mean, we've got global uh, or at least near global sperm counts plummeting in the uh, in the modern world. And I, I believe there are equally serious uh, infertility problems that women are having as well in much of the industrial world. So if, if you're an alien uh, looking for specimens to abduct, you may have a harder and harder time. So maybe maybe they got what they wanted uh, and maybe they could be done. But I don't think that's the case. I still think that there are cases of contact that are out there uh, on my website over at Richard Ola members. I've, you know, I've heard from a number of the folks on my site who seem to be having fairly relatively recent contact experiences. So it's hard to quantify that. It's very hard to quantify that. I would like very briefly to just address the last qu uh, question you had there, sure. also, Robbie, which was just on, are the aliens themselves uh, promoting a kind of disclosure by letting us see them more. I think I might be inclined to disagree with Lou Elizondo and Ross Coltart on okay. at least if they truly believe that these craft are being more brazen than they were in the past. I don't think that's the case. 
when you look at the history of this, uh, there are some unbelievably up close and personal encounters that um, people have had, both just ordinary folks and military people with these UFOs going way back to the 40s and 50s. Some, I mean, hair raising, tremendously traumatic events. Uh, what's different is that we have a better ability to record these now. And what's particularly different is in the last four years, we've had a faction within our society that's been able to break open the wall a little bit. And so that we're able to get some of this information out. I, I'm not personally convinced that the, uh, the ETs or whoever's behind these UFOs, that their policy is any different. I'm not, I'm, it's not clear to me. I think what's a little bit different is that we have more of a um, more of a, a through way for information to pass to the to the public. But uh, as far as the the other side of it, I, d- I don't know that there's been any change. OK, my opinion. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I was I think Colt Hart said he had a, a source or a few sources telling him that. And of course, Elizondo said that I don't know what his sources were, maybe his his tenure at uh, a tip. He, he came to that assessment. But anyways, um, James, uh, what, what's your take on, on that initial question? Well, uh, first, I just want to address kind of what Rich said. And I think par- part of that really could be, again, like Rich said, uh, you know, we have better sensor capabilities. We have more sensors. We have more satellites. We have better technology to kind of see that kind of thing nowadays. Um, but, and, and also, again, the fact now, at, at the very least, you know, if, if you don't want to consider the from the beginning of a tip when they're saying, OK, we're looking for this now. And, you know, sometimes when when you're looking for something, you're more likely to find it. So there's probably there could be some of that phenomenon at work, too. It's like we're just, you know, um, kind of like there's a story uh, of, um, you know, the Native Americans couldn't see the ships coming because they didn't see, you know, they didn't have the understanding of what they were they weren't expecting them basically. And if you're expecting something, you're, you're probably going to be more um, likely to see it. So I, that's for that end of the question or what Rich, Rich was saying. Um, but as far as uh, abductions, right? So when we're talking about abductions, uh, the, the larger, the meta picture of that is contact. And um, there still seems to be a lot of contact going on. It's just, it's in, in my opinion, it seems to be, the um, kind of the focus of where we're looking um, in a sense, because again, like, like um, Jay was saying before, you know, there was all the the phases of the contactees and these kind of human looking ET uh, contactee experiences that were very widely reported back then, but uh, you don't hear as much of that uh, nowadays. Um, But, you know, again, if you want to talk about the CE5 community, or you know, people doing contact work. There's there's people regularly going out and and doing contact work and having different types of experiences. Um, and even if you want to mention like the the Bloodstone case, we know that's a recent case where there's a lot of interactions supposedly going on. Um, and even again, the the Bloodstone case mentions missing time. So again, with his um, uh, him being having three hours is that an abduction or a contact case where he was on board possibly? Um, so I think that there there's still things going on with contact. Uh, but you know, one thing that always uh, baffles me about the the contact thing is that there's there's random. <laughs> kind of like phases of like, oh, it's abductions. And then there's no abductions. Like you had Dr. Kit Green saying, oh, there's no abductions and, and, uh, and other people like that. And that, that always comes up in that circle. And um, again, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. Um, but I think that all, all this kind of stuff is still going on everything, you know, between the contact and the, and you know, what people report as onboard experiences and then you have to have to also consider, um, you know, what part of those experiences are, are purely psychic in nature, right? If I can even say that if it's going on in a consciousness kind of realm or people actually being physically taken. Um, they're certainly not the um, focus as there was in the 1990s with, you know, possibly, you know, John Mack, uh, the late and great Dr. John Mack. 
um, writing these books, you know, coming from a Harvard professor and going on Oprah. So there was a large emphasis there of, oh, my God, because I think at that time, people were like, holy crap, this might actually be real. And there was probably a focus on that. So um, and again, getting to what Rich was saying about the DNA thing. Um, you know, people have speculated that the reason that some of the stuff, the contact on that level, CE4's onboard experiences were going on, uh, were because they wanted to study the changes that we were doing to ourselves from, uh, you know, everything we're doing to the planet and our technology and all these chemicals and how it's biologically changing us. Uh, and then if you want to complicate the situ situation even more, you know, John Ramirez recently has been talking a lot about this hybridization thing, which, um, again, to people just hearing about the subject might sound like, oh, my, like out of the box. But uh, people who have been really looking into this, this phenomenon has been here for a very long time and um, they seem to have some kind of interest. So what if that interest is, you know, um, actually an involved interest and, um, you know, if if if. They, they had some kind of ongoing experimentation or guided evolutionary process thing going on. I would see that as a continual process. Um, so I, I think it has to do with where people's focus is. Um, but I, I, I do always have that same question is how do, how come you don't hear about the abduction thing as much? And I think, again, part of it is, is stigma because you had cases like, um, uh, Stan Romanek, for example, which were highly controversial and seemed to have genuine qualities and then some qualities that could have been fabricated. Um, so, again, it's, it's it's kind of an area that that comes and goes and is sometimes really shunned in the research area. And again, now with the emphasis on UAP and these military cases and, and that thing, there's a lot of focus there. And um I think it's good that we are having this talk and, and emphasizing uh, some of the deeper questions, because uh, I think if, if, if there's ever a time that we're going to have a, a clear look at this, this is like the beginning of that time. Yeah, and I'm just going to build on the idea that 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 both of you, I think, touched on, which is that as our technology gets better, we detect these objects more. Well, I recollect that right before the USS Nimitz UFO event series in December, uh, no, November of 2004, that their radar systems were upgraded. And the same is true for the 2015 events with Ryan Graves and, and some other aviators off the East Coast that prior to, to some of those uh, detections with their equipment, I think their equipment was, was upgraded, which, which is interesting because it, it seems to suggest that possibly that these things are just in our biosphere doing what they're doing. And, and as long as our technology keeps progressing, we're going to get better and better at detecting them. And on the one hand, our military, the US government and other militaries have to strive to improve their technology so that they can compete and be a deterrence for other countries invading them. But on the other hand, this, this, this technological process may lead to, to the insulation of this reality to become completely impossible, and I think I think that is uh, is the case, and I think that that will that, that scenario will actually continue to escalate, and denial of this issue will will become much more ridiculous and and untenable as technology progresses uh, on on a military level and even private industry with Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. But anyways, Jay, what's your opinion on on the core question that we've been discussing here? Well, um, thanks. I, 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 I agree with the other panelists. And I, th I think that from what I see, you know, um, being uh, one of the co-founders of the Experiencer Group. And so I, I'm actually, when we leave this panel show, I'm going to go straight to a support group for, for Experiencers. And uh, as I do many times a week, um, and having over a thousand people come through there, just since we opened the doors in, in February, it, you, you start to get a sense of the gestalt. You get a sense of the overall shape of things. I don't think that I, I have any special view 
Um, uh, but I do think that I, I, I'm starting to see some characteristics. I'm starting to see some data points that start connecting, you know, and uh, first of all, one thing is, is that the experiencer group really started in private confidential situations through Richard Dolan members. Um, and so um, Kirsten Blackburn and I, and Stuart Davis, um, I, you know, uh, until the end of the time, I want to thank Richard for giving us the space and the time uh, and, and the belief to be able to, to create that kind of an environment where, where people could speak honestly and confidentially uh, about this stuff. It's, it was, it, it was absolutely crucial um, to our development and the development of the experiencer community uh, for having the space that, that Richard and Tracy allowed, allowed for us there. So thanks. Thanks to Richard for that. Um, and, but along the, uh, along the lines of, of talking about abductions and whether they've stopped and it's like, they haven't stopped there. There's been no stopping of that. I like, there are slow periods. There are long period, you know, there are these erratic schedules that we don't necessarily understand. And again, as we've all been kind of alluding to, maybe this has something to do with some grander time scale that we don't necessarily know. Right. Um, but I'm hearing of, without breaking any confidentiality, I'm hearing of, of contact situations with children right now, you know, children that are, you know, younger than adolescent age. So it, it hasn't stopped. It's, it's still continuing. There seems to be this general pattern as Jacobs, Mac, and others have pointed towards Matt, Kathleen Martin, Yvonne Smith, others, where there seems to be a high point generally speaking from between adolescent age through the twenties because of some, maybe some biological, some, some, the, the kind of what's called the hybridization program and whatnot, where things pick up right during that period. And then there seems to be some erratic, you know, check-ins and uh, on some periodic scale that we can't understand after that point. But um, we're still seeing people cycle into this from a very young age. We're talking like sometimes as young as six and seven years old. Um, and so it hasn't stopped. And, and, you know, I think along the lines of what all of you have been speaking of, I think a lot of it comes down to stigma. And it's that we're not going to be necessarily hearing about those kids in their early 20s right now that are really going through that at this moment, possibly. Um, because they're in that moment and I'm, I'm about to turn 43 years old next week, next week. Right. And what 20 year old wants to talk to a 43 year old about this stuff, <laughs> you know what I mean? Or anybody else. And so there's, there's the problem of the generational situation, right. Where those kinds of stigmas, like I had to work my way through it and it took a lot, you know, to get to the position that, that I'm at and being able to speak about it. And and other people are going to have to do that in their own way, quietly, and maybe not do that at all. You know. Great. So my next question is: obviously, there's a, a a vast array of literature that has been collected over the decades with various researchers uh, speaking with experiencers, and they relay uh, seeing different species, different appearances of of the beings. I'm always very interested that Travis Walton saw the Nordics because I, I think his abduction experience is one of the most uh, well-documented. And it just, it just blows my mind that he saw Nordics, which suggests that that could be a real alien species. Unless this is all psychological and we're dealing with psychotronic weapons and what's really happening is, is these experiences are being manipulated in people's minds from afar using technology. I don't know the answer to that question, but after going through all the literature that we've, we've attained over the years and, and reading all the stories, do you, do you, do you, Richard, think that we can come to any confident understanding of who exactly is behind this phenomenon, different species, whether they're interdimensional or whether they are physical from other planets or even ultra terrestrial somehow tethered to our planet? And in addition to that, can we have any confidence on what the agenda is of these of, of, of these intelligences based upon the experiencer um, literature that we've acquired? And what's your take on that, Richard? I do. I do think we can answer those questions, at least pretty well. Uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, and this is <clears throat> related to what you're asking, 
is that, you know, when we're talking about these other beings, one thing we really have to start asking, and this is something that could happen in the mainstream, it seems to me, is, is like, what the hell are they actually doing with all of these UFO encounters? Forget, forget contact and abduction for a moment. We're seeing countless numbers of UFOs around the world every day. Um, now, look, you, you go into some of the databases that are out there, and obviously most of those sightings are probably going to be explained in some conventional way. But here's the thing. There are so many thousands of reports every single year in North America alone. All right. And North America has really got the best reporting systems in place in terms of the web. But there's just thousands of these. And, you know, as I've been pointing this out for a long time, I don't hear any other UFO researchers mentioning the fact that you get a number of these sightings that are taking place at like three in the morning over residential neighborhoods of these stealthy objects, disc shaped, triangular shaped, whatever they are, hanging out over your house, shining beams of light down. Now, the only reason they're seen at all is when someone goes out for a, they can't sleep, they got a cigarette break, they're out in their little hot tub at night, whatever it is that's causing them to, causing them to be out, and they'll see these things that are not always easy, but they're there. There's there is a, a global agenda going on relating to these objects, and we have to really ask ourselves what are they actually doing? Maybe, you know, back in the 1950s, people thought, well, they're they've just arrived. So they're here to case the joint. They're here to scope out the planet and surveil. Well, nothing happened after that. And now we're a full human lifetime down the road here. And we're now we're looking at vast numbers of sightings. What are they doing? My best hypothesis is that they live here. They've got their own massive infrastructure. They're just doing what they do. And they have up until recently been very, very good at being ultra stealthy and not letting us see them, but we're, we are now becoming better at detecting them. And so this is becoming at least potentially a much more difficult uh, scenario for all parties concerned because our technology is just going exponential. So what are they doing? Where are they from? I, I go on the assumption that they're from another planet because I know that there are other planets. I don't know for sure that there are really other dimensions. I mean, I do, but I don't really understand how living in another dimension really works. I don't know anyone who really does. Now, uh, it is t totally possible that these beings have figured out a science that can manipulate space and time as we understand space and time. And so on that basis, they might be able to manipulate space or time in ways that really confuse the hell out of us. And, and we might think, okay, they're interdimensional, or maybe that means they can be interdimensional in some sense. Maybe that's true, but I don't think that rules out an interplanetary thesis here. So my assumption is that they're from somewhere else. My assumption also is that they live here. They've Earth is a great place. Like we all know that it's got an abundance of life. It's got a, like all of these unique DNA forms. If you know how to manipulate DNA really well, Earth is a great place to come. And also, I personally believe that they are here because of us, because of humanity. I think that we're really an important part of this. And it's our development right now that is key because, you know, for hundreds of thousands of years, we've really, there, there was not a whole lot we could have done about them. In fact, there was nothing we could have done about them. But in the last century or so, there's been a lot that we can do and our capabilities have just gone parabolic. So we're, we're leaping into their world as we speak. We've got AI coming online, strong generative AI, not just, you know, uh, but really powerful stuff. And then of course, we've got CRISPR technology where we've mastered our genome. We're gonna be creating transhumanist individuals in the ne this coming generation. Uh, and then, you know, we're turning our society, as I keep saying, into one big anthill with 5G, 6G surveillance tech. There's no more privacy. We're completely transforming human culture. And therefore, we're, we're disempowering individuals, but we are empowering our collective vastly. The weapons that are coming online, all of this, these are things that these other beings, they have got to be concerned about that. So I think that they're here because of us. And if I were them, 
uh, I would be very interested in finding ways to manage the process that we, that our species is now going through. So whether that means control it or just uh, defang it from their point of view, whatever. But I think I think that's what they're about. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I think Elizondo recently said somewhere that a possible reason that UAP are attracted to nuclear technology is because that represents the splitting of the atom and that represents our technological evolution. And so they want to see how much further we're continuing to go as it, as it pertains to, to nuclear technology, because at some point we may become a threat to, to the zookeepers as it were, and we might be get, get out of the cage and start causing problems to them. And I think that's an interesting interpretation because a lot of people like to just assume that, oh, they're monitoring our nukes because they want us to get rid of our weapons. Well, yeah, that's possible, but there's other equally plausible possibilities as well. Anyways, uh, James, what, what's your take on this discussion here? Can you, can you rephrase the, your original question? Sure. My original question is, so there's been lots of researchers interviewing experiencers and collating data and comparing and contrasting different people's experiences. And that's how we've, we've come to the assessment that there, there are possibly different species like Nordics and reptilians and greys. And, and also they've received messages from these beings. So based upon that historical record, can we have any confidence on what the agenda or agendas are of, of this intelligence or intelligences and what, what, they, what they represent, biological creatures from other planets and so forth? Can we do that based upon the knowledge that we've acquired thus far through the, through the interviewing of experiencers? Okay. Uh, thanks. Great question. Yeah. Cause I didn't want to just riff off of uh, everything Rich went into cause he just went into a whole another thing, uh, which is, I mean, great stuff I can go off of there. But um, so again, so from the experiencers angle, there's one thing, but uh, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and say, I think that we've obtained uh, you know, ma the materials, right? I think that there are, you know, all world vehicles in our possession and, and, probably entities i think that there's some validity to those stories um so in that sense I, I think that there is a part a small section of humanity that at least knows a lot more than we do um technically right like the the genetic makeup of of maybe some of the entities and or if it's a byproduct of their technology and they're sending um you know what people call program life forms right if they're if so-called some of these entities are, are technologies. Um, so I, I think that th there is a small group that has access to that kind of knowledge. Um, may, even if they don't fully understand it, they have more of an idea of us of possibly, you know, um, I don't want to say the origin, because even if you have all that stuff, that doesn't mean you know where they're from. Um, so I think that it's, it's very possible that at least, some some group in humanity has a better idea than than even researchers of the general public. Um, I know that you know uh, people in the invisible college will often say like you know they they still don't know if it's if it's one phenomenon you know posing as as many or it's it's um, or if it's several different phenomena. My own impression is that it's several different intelligences we're dealing with. And um, the aspect of, of the nuclear question, right? I think, you know, we, we're we at a stage now, right? Like maybe they want us to just disarm all our nuclear weapons so we don't destroy the planet, number one, because they might be co-inhabiting it. Um, but also again, you know, we don't hear these stories of, of much of, of the crash retrievals into the nuclear stuff comes on board. So, you know, that's when you start hearing about uh, the Roswells and, and, and actually, you know, Starfish Prime, where allegedly uh, nuclear detonation was, was capable of taking, you know, UFOs down. Um, again, if you, if you believe that story, which I think that there's some legitimacy to that story. Um, so there's, there's a lot to go there. And, um, Again, with the, with all these encounters, you know, there's that great Peter Lavenda quote where he he says, you know, some of these interactions, it doesn't seem, you know, the interactions are so impactful. 
um, that they don't, you know, the, the result of the contact doesn't seem to be a side effect, but the, actually the whole point of the encounter to begin with. Um, so maybe that, that level of interaction and contact on all the different levels we've seen is not just them collecting data and observing, but actually some kind of engagement with us. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I would go with that. Cool. Cool. How about you, Jay? What, what's your take on this discussion? Well, um, I, I, I agree with Richard and James. I, I think that there does seem to be, along with what they're saying, I think there, there does seem to be some kind of co-inhabiting presence or multiple presences. You know, Eric Davis speaks often about, or he's spoken a few times in any way about like the idea of the shadow biome, that there could be some, some unseen uh, level uh, where, where, intelligence could be living beings could be living in that we don't quite understand uh, very much like how we didn't really observe the vastness of the mycelial mycelial network until very recently. Right. And, you know, there's, I think that there's, there are, there are beguiling aspects of course, with contact that, that, that could scare or, or, or really weird people out in terms of, okay, telepathic contact, right? Why, you know, if I speak English and another uh, abductee speaks Japanese, how do these beings know to speak Japanese? Even within that situation, there seems to be a a lingual base understanding of sometimes metaphors and things like that will be used that'll be specific to the kind of person that's receiving this this information that creates a very hall of mirrors situation, right? Where you could hear from an abductee that was a chemical engineer and chemical engineering terms might be used or an artist might be contacted and, and, and beings will use artistic terms. And, and that kind of hall of mirrors effect can have this beguiling aspect where you know, one one theory that I've heard recently that I really it, it have been kind of toying around with uh, as a thought experiment, which is pretty great, is that what if the, some of these ideas of screen memories and these situations that people like Whitley Strieber have talked about where they'll be on a ship and then they'll see their dead grandmother or something like that. And it appears for all intents and purposes to be some kind of hologram, right? Well, what if, you know, in situations like this, that what if a being is so ontologically different than us that they can't really see what is our conscious versus our subconscious. So they're just approaching us on this telepathic capability where they're looking for something that'll, that'll create safety, right. Or something that'll, that'll, that'll promote um, an idea of comfort. And, you know, we, have this this prism of our conscious life where, where it's kind of like a, a computer desktop and we're looking at icons and there's just like what is like right in front of us but then we have all those files that are sitting back there about our mom about our families about our upbringing about talismans and icons that make us feel scared or more comfortable and what if some of these beings like just conveniently tapped into this 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 realm of our subconscious without even recognizing that that might even be a subconscious element for us at the outset. Right. And then at the same time, we have these physical tethers, like we were talking about, like, you know, we're getting better at detection. And so there's these areas like the Catalina Island, right. The Pyrenees areas of rural Canada play a, like a specific area of Alaska that people are starting to center in center toward and saying like, that might be where they are. Maybe they're right there. Right. And so at the same time, we have this kind of talismanic um, uh, shamanic element that may be um, as simple. I'm not saying it is, but it could be as simple as, as a a problem of translation and, and kind of a, a necessary workaround where there are these, these physical tethers. And so as we understand the communicative aspects of contact it might get us and these different ontologies it might give us a more tethered scientific understanding where things don't seem so woo they just seem like a a an understanding of the science or the translation element wow i'll have to rewatch that one that element again that very very nice 
So I'm going to ask Richard a question and then uh, I'll let him go after this because I know his time is limited. So Richard, um, I guess a two-part question and you can include anything you want or you can ignore my questions because this is the, your final contribution. So feel free to take it however you wish. But what do you make of hotspots, areas in the world where it appears that that UFOs are seen much more often in, than in other areas? And do you think that poltergeist activity um, is underreported with UFO sightings? Because I know Dr. Eric Davis at one point stated that 100% of sightings are associated with poltergeist experiences, which I don't think I, I buy necessarily. Maybe he was just saying that for effect. But it does appear that there are a lot more poltergeist experiences that are associated with UFO sightings than maybe are, are talked about in the literature, or maybe there's an element of people not wanting to share that part of their experience because they're already telling people they saw something crazy and maybe they don't want to add any more craziness to, to, to the conversation so that they protect them, the, the, how people perceive them a little bit. What's your take on that, Richard? Yeah, totally possible. I would say, I don't think that 100% of UFO encounters are connected with poltergeist activities. I can't believe Eric Davis uh, said that seriously. If he did, I, I would love to uh, see his data, but um I would say that there are certain, I mean, you get a lot of talk these days about the so-called hitchhiker effect. Uh, you hear it a lot in relation to uh, the Skinwalker Ranch, but not just Skinwalker. In other words, you have an experience on this location and, and um, it could be a UFO sighting or some other bizarre thing that you've seen. And then when you leave that spot, you are still plagued by some kind of paranormal type of activity that always seems to be very unpleasant. I, I, I talked uh, at length with Travis Taylor about this. Um, he was telling me about this and I had the distinct impression he was experiencing a hitchhiker effect that uh, was not pleasant. So I think there's something going on there for sure. And I suspect that we're dealing with um, certain parts of our world where this phenomenon where, I mean, if, it, if it's possible that there's a kind of interdimensional travel, like a wormhole or something like that, um, which I actually believe is, is probably true, um, only based on anecdotal testimony that I've gotten personally from witnesses and, then, and read. So if that's the case, and there might be a few spots on this world of ours where it's going to be like a, a doorway, like a portal, some people will say. And I think that's entirely possible. And if that's the case, you might, you might in fact see, um, you know, a much higher percentage of activity. Now, does that mean that these are the same thing as ghosts or demonic entities or what have? I don't know. I don't know what these all of these beings are. Um, we're only at the beginning phases of trying to figure some of this out. I I think that we're dealing with extraterrestrial al aliens at least. But that doesn't mean that we're not dealing with other kinds of entities that other beings that have some other kind of existence that we really haven't been able to uh, prove, but that could very well be the case. So there's, there's a long way to go here. The last thing I'll just say, and I do have to go, thanks for having me on here. Um, we really have got to get past this uh, we have a, we're at a very low level of public conversation on the subject of UFO or UAP in general. It's very low level. It, yes, it's far better than it was more than four years ago. That's true. But we, we have such a long way to go. And we need to be talking about, A, the cover-up, which is a real thing. And it's serious and it's deep and it's completely illegal. And I would say criminal. Uh, and we need to be talking about contact with these other beings and what is their agenda? Why are they flying around the world every single day? What are they actually doing to people? Is there, do they have an end game? I mean, I've had my own speculations about this, which yes, I did write about in the book last year, but you know, there's gotta be many, many other ideas and a lot more research out there. We, we've got to get this out here. We need to have an adult conversation about this. In uh, among UFO researchers and then the public at large. Great, thank you very much for joining us today, Richard. Thank you. It was a lot. It was a real pleasure being on with all of you guys. I'll take my leave, but uh, carry on. It was it was great. <laughs> thank thank you. you. Take care. Good to see you, Richard. Bye, guys.
Take care, Rich. All right. So I guess we'll just, uh, how, how much longer do you guys want to go? Um, how, how a, little, can, a little bit. I can go for a tiny bit longer. All right. So let's just. I, could, I, I think uh, I could do another 15 or something like that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Let's just continue with the question that I asked Richard. Uh, so you're up, uh, James. What do you think regarding? The yeah, so, hot, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so hot spots, you know, this is a thing that, that comes up and, you know, people have speculated is, is there some kind of electromagnetic effect in certain areas that allow for, um, you know, UFOs to more easily enter our reality? I mean, th there's a possibility of that, but it's, it's, it doesn't seem to be the case where that would even limit to where they would go because say if they have to go to Mount Shasta or Catalina Island or somewhere to pop into our reality, they could be almost anywhere in the world within seconds based on what we've seen them do as far as observing their capabilities. Um, you know, and, you know, there's another thing that kind of goes into the hotspots is with, with, you know, UFO waves, right, right here in the Hudson Valley. Um, there was a, a pretty big UFO wave in the, in the 1980s and, you know, the, um, in Florida, the Pensacola area, uh, there was a wave over there in the 90s. And, you know, there seemed to be waves in these different areas. Of course, Skinwalker Ranch. And at, at that level, with the Skinwalker Ranch, I think especially in, in poltergeist activity, we have to, I think, question is, is this adjacent to or directly related to the UFO phenomenon? Are we seeing something that's indicative of the UFO phenomenon or or you know, something aside from that, that, that happens to uh, be associated with the UFO phenomenon. Right. And again, does their technology or, or just those, you know, specific areas uh, have an environment where um, the uh, other, you know, phenomena that we observe sometimes with UFO phenomenon um you know, come out again, is it due to those locations or does their technology create an effect where um, just say like with, with contact, right. With an individual um, say they have a contact experience is that be due to that contact experience. Is there some kind of residual hypo hyperspatial awareness, right? Does that contact, whether it's the technology or just having a, an awakening experience like that opens something from within them that they can perceive, um, you know, what we would call something like hyperspace, right? Something beyond the regular 3D reality. Um, you know, there's that case of Dr. X from Jacques Vallée's book, uh, The Invisible College, where he had these contact experiences, but then, you know, there's the UFO, you know, the after effects that's reported, um, you know, from um from these encounters where you know whether you want to call it a hitchhiker or something else um where people are experiencing what we can call poltergeist activity or psychic phenomenon after the encounters is it a, an effect of the actual ufos themselves or is it an effect that happens within us you know as an you know as a result of of kind of that paradigm shattering you know experience where you just see that there's more, right? Uh, so that's that's a huge question. And again, you can get down to the idea of um, the, the genetic and um, you know physiological components of individuals, where you know you have the the caudate uh, nucleus uh, with the hyperactivity there, and and people being able to perceive this phenomenon more readily. Um, and I, I think in that in the recent articles that um, Gary Nolan indicated that this is something that people are born with, not necessarily something that happens as a result of the contact. Um, but who's to say that, you know, even on a small scale, if somebody has an encounter that it begins that process and then their next of kin has that kind of genetic component after they have the, you know, the encounter. And now they have some kind of biological effect that goes on from there on. Um, there, there's a lot really to unpack there. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short there. Yeah. And I just want to add that I, I think I did see Dolan's interview with Travis Taylor and I don't have it in front of me, but I think Taylor toyed with the idea that maybe 
the hitchhiker effect is related to quantum uh, entanglement in some way. So that when you, you're, you're actually becoming entangled with this phenomenon in some way, and it's, it may be some residual aspect of it is, is attaching to you once, you, once you've, once you've come into close proximity to it. Go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add one more thing. In one of the videos I just made uh, called um, contact and stream entry, and it's really another version of, you know, contact and awakening experiences and it fits in very actually really good with that, that quantum entanglement aspect that's mentioned because I've mentioned before with contact, um, I think that there is an entrainment process uh, and an entrainment is when like you have, you know, um, like they talk about it with clocks, right? Like the kind of the strongest clock, uh, the swinging of it or a pendulum is going to eventually all the other pendulums fall in line with, with the main one. So, or if there's like temperature, right? It doesn't, if there's a high temperature and a low temperature, what they do is they equalize it's, and, um, and they meet a, mean, a medium, right? So I think to some degree, contact has that effect where if the, the, you know, the intelligence is operating here and we're down here, uh, just the, the, the interaction wow. with that is, is going to bring us up uh, a level or two where, uh, again, if you're having a telepathic experience or a download, is that just a one-way street or, or can you peer back a little? And once you've seen that, you have some um, permanent kind of opening and awareness to that reality. Yeah, that's interesting. That kind of reminds me of people with near-death experiences. They come back and they, they have new skills or uh, new new experiences in, in mediumship or whatever that they never had before. And that might relate in some way, possibly. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask, um, and it's, before I go further, after Jay gets done answering this question, I'm going to ask you all one last question and then we'll wrap it up. Go ahead, Jay. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. And thanks, James. Um, you know, a lot, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up the Hudson Valley, uh, James, because, you know, it, it actually is a perfect case. Um, you know, Mitch Horowitz, the writer, wrote this pretty great book, really great book, actually called Occult America, that covers the history of, of occult um, beliefs in, through the spread of America. And it actually focuses on the Hudson Valley and talks about how so much of, of kind of early mediumship and contact contact initiated events and kind of a wider framework um, really ballooned out of the area of the Hudson Valley. Right. And so it's interesting that that later became that that became kind of a UFO phenomena or a hotspot, um, given that we when we think about places like Skinwalker Ranch, we, we think like, was there some kind of longstanding Native American situation that kind of somehow seeded this area as an area of interest through some form of spell casting, you know, we have all these ideas, but how different is that idea of spell casting in a place like the Uinta Basin um, from the idea of a bunch of, of, of people in the 1800s uh, performing acts of mediumship where they were trying to contact the dead, you know, Ouija boards, all this other kind of stuff. Right. And, and so it's really interesting that there are these kind of overlaps and the idea that possibly there could be a connection in terms of like these center points where a bunch of people are trying to make contact using consciousness with some in some kind of greater degree. And then that maybe there's a lag effect where even those people leave like within Skinwalker Ranch and there's still maybe because of that kind of quantum entanglement or the idea like we were talking about earlier about different time scales. What about, we always, we talk about quantum entanglement and we, we often make the idea that we could eventually communicate across vast distances given quantum entanglement, but maybe time's not such a, a big deal either in that situation of quantum entanglement. So maybe some of this, this trickster phenomena, some of this other stuff that we see could be indicative of the idea that 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 there is that entanglement or that there could be a longer concept of the present like what is the present moment to us it's very specific but if we look at a hummingbird their refresh rate their like screen refresh rate is like way the way the heck faster than ours right 
And so what if there's, what, what if there are other beings where the present moment actually lasts six hours rather than a moment? And so all these kinds of trickster phenomena of things moving around and stuff like that could be the advantageous situation involving a, a quantum entangled area. You know, and I'm speaking completely out of turn as a non-scientist in this realm, but I think that there's something there and there has been some idea within Skinwalker that maybe there's some kind of defense line, right? Like we do with dogs where it's like you put the collar on and then dog can't leave the yard because it'll get shocked or whatever. What if there's some kind of like, like cosmic fence over, over some of these portal areas where this kind of longer present, this kind of entangled area is in effect on within some scale that might be most akin to like a piece of software in a way that we don't quite understand that could, that could affect things like this in a form of consciousness. I love that idea. And I think that there's, that there may be some, some huge validity to it in terms of these portal or seeming nexus points. So this is going to be the last question. And then once we all answer it, we'll just uh, share our social media or whatever. But right now we're discussing some pretty uh, quote unquote woo woo stuff down the rabbit hole as you, as it were. And if any skeptics are watching right now, they probably thinking, Oh, these, these gentlemen are just out of their minds and they're, they're wasting their lives and so forth. And yet that perspective that they have may be completely obliterated in a single moment. Once, for example, whether it's Project Galileo or UAPX or the U.S. government shares some irrefutable evidence that there are unaccounted for machines in our atmosphere and oceans that are not created by human beings, then we kind of have to discuss all of the stories and theories that are associated with, with this phenomenon. Otherwise, we're just sticking our head in the sand. So I think, I think, but I could be wrong. I think all of us are going to have the last laugh. Now, I think all three of us are experiencers. Um, that, that's my understanding. And so here's the question. This is a little bit politically incorrect. I don't mean to offend anyone, but it's a question that has to be broached. We have the Gillibrand Rubio Amendment. So there's no question that this topic is going to become more elevated uh, you know, Elizondo has spoken about a 23 minute video. He's spoken about a photograph that was taken in a cockpit of a plane of, a, of, of I think, a UAP 50 feet away. We, we, it, it appears very likely that there is this extremely high fidelity data that would end the debate on whether UFOs really exist and, and that they almost certainly do not originate from human civilization. So as we progress in this process, do any are any of you concerned that people are going to come forward and say, yeah, I'm an experiencer. This is what happened to me because they because they want the attention, maybe that they perceive they're going to get. And maybe there'll be an explosion of, of, of people who are truly experiencers and have had experiences they can't explain. And then it's also. Along with that equation, there's going to be people who are just making stuff up and LARPing and just want attention uh, toward them. So how are we as a research community? How are academics and scientists, because I know it sounds silly now, like, oh, academics and scientists are going to start interviewing experiencers. That will never happen. Well, like I said, once, once we get that high fidelity data, I think it will happen. It has to happen. And so when that takes place, how are the great minds of our civilization, our, our psychologists, our scientists, our academics, how are they going to be able to differentiate between people making stuff up and people who had genuine experiences? And furthermore, should we anticipate that there will be an, a, a huge segment of people who will make stuff up as, as our perspective on this enigma changes, or will that always be the minority? So I'll start with you, James and Iandoli. Yeah, I think for sure. And, 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 you know, for better or worse, right, this is just going to be a process that we're going to have to deal with. It's going to naturally happen. Um, and so I think, that there are people that are literally just going to feel more comfortable talking who had genuine experiences. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing. Another thing is that Robert Hastings, Bob Jacobs, go on. <laughs> right. I, I, and, and, I, you know, extremely credible people here we're talking about. Um, so I think that is going to happen. We're going to have more people that are genuine experiences come forward. Um, I think there's going to be, there will be people genuinely confused as if to, if they had an experience or not, that's, I think that's real. Like if somebody had a dream of contact, you know, how do you determine, right? 
So, I mean, I've, I've had the experiences where I had a dream, but then I, I had a, a UFO encounter afterwards. So what if people have some kind of genuine contact dream in an astral realm, right? Can you track that? Uh, can you quantify that? I, I don't know. Um, and then, of course, there's there's people that are are just going to be LARPing, right? Like <laughs> live action role play. There's people <laughs> that are going to be hoaxers. There's people that have been hoaxers this whole time. You know, uh, look at um, uh, Dr. Jonathan Reed and that whole story that was, um, you know, and, and, and I think somebody and then you have cases like Billy Meyer. Right. Where I think that the dude probably had some initial encounters, maybe even if they were just close sightings. And then it, it turned into this whole thing and he, he got caught out faking some things, which I think he at those some of that stuff was nonsense. Um, but there were people that that came to his property and had seen genuine phenomena from what I understand. Um, so you're going to have this whole mixed bag. Uh, there there are genetic markers that whole genetic marker thing is is from what i understand legitimate um now i don't i don't think they're just going to go around testing everybody um well i well no but well actually i, I that's a whole nother conversation well but if, um, if, if there's like research researchers with grants and they they have like 100 people maybe they could test that 100 people a small sample size right so yeah right and and i think that is doable and i think uh uh, it's obvious what we're talking about with people like Dr. Gary Nolan uh, have been doing research in that area and have a very good understanding of how you'd be able to physiologically identify if somebody's had at least a close encounter um, with UAP uh, and obviously Dr. Craig Green and or have the um, the physical physiological uh, caudate nucleus uh kind of um, hyperconnectivity where they're able to perceive uh, the other phenomenon, which is, which is also getting into the aspect of psychic perception, hyperspatial awareness, uh, things like t- of that degree. So um, I think there is going to be an uptick uh, in, in all that, right? It's, I think it's inevitable. I think um, we haven't even seen the beginning of the explosion of, of the, the UFO reality and the UAP reality in our culture. I think, you know, even though we have all these like endless science fiction films and stories, I think when, when like there's like a disclosure, like almost going off Richard Dolan and Bryce Zabel's after disclosure kind of book and that whole theme, I think once there's like, the real deal disclosure where it's like indefinitely stated that we are being engaged by non-human intelligence, that there is going to be an explosion in all areas. You know, I think there's going to be religions that take root that are kind of like based on UFOs and, and contact. And you're probably going to have more people come forward as UFO prophets. Um, I mean, even to a small degree, uh, Dr. Stephen Greer, um, whether that was his, his intention or not, and even even Tom DeLong, you know, these people have uh, an almost religious like following where if you question what they've said, you know, you're it's it's almost a, like you're attacking somebody's religion and belief system. So we've seen small effects of that, you know, um, but I, I think that, yeah, when when, <laughs> when this is and I think possibly that's that's why the rollout is being done so carefully. And I think that is a genuine concern of how this is going to roll out. What are the the psychological and sociological effects of this going to be, you know, not just of the stock market, but of the human psyche. Um, So that's, oh man, that's like a huge area of study from several different points. And I I think that's going to be a fascinating thing to watch unfold. But again, we're going to, I think in, in that case, you know, UFO researchers have a good experience of, of, of being able to determine what's like a fake and because we've seen all the hoaxes, you know, so we have a good idea of like, what are we looking for when a new case comes out as to if there's validity. But again, on the other side of that, seeing researchers come from the mainstream and being able to, um, you know, lend their capabilities and, and, and um, skills to how to better kind of root that out is, is going to be very helpful. And I think, 
you know, when you have more investigative journalists and, and maybe even forensic researchers involved, um, they're going to, we're going to have a, a method and science and how to vol- validate contact experiences going forward. That makes sense. So in other words, we'll develop methodologies to make our research more effective to, to, to differentiate between those that are potentially more likely telling the truth than others. And I just want to build on your Cade uh, nucleus. Uh, was that, what's it called? Cade what? It's the you can call it a nucleus and call it a pertainment. Okay, I'll call it. I'll, I'll go with the first option because I, I read the article where Gary Nolan was interviewed, and I just I just thought to myself, well, maybe some of these species we're dealing with have a a really like they're called a nucleus equivalent is really well developed, so they have access to realities that we simply don't yet. Maybe someday our caught a nucleus will be much more developed and human beings interaction with the fabric of reality will, will shift a little bit. So I'll go into Jay King. What's your take on the concern of this becoming more mainstream more talked about, and then some people wanting attention and making up stories and how do we differentiate as best we can between those who are giving us legitimate um, stories as best as they know, know it. And those that are just totally embellishing overwhelmingly, or even worse, making it all up. How, how do we, how do we navigate that? Sure. Thank you. I think that's an interesting question and I appreciate both of you for bringing it up, uh, and exploring it. Um, you know, I, I think a, uh, there's a lot more experiencers than we probably know about. And so as, as you're kind of accurately predicting, I think there's, as this becomes less stigmatized, there's, there's going to be more accounts than we know what to do with. You know what I mean? It's, it's like any, it it might be at a certain point where any medium sized town has 12 Whitley Strebers. Uh, You know what I mean? That's, that's entirely, (laughs) entirely possible, you know? And, and if that were to be the case, like it could feel overwhelming at times, but at the same time, what we found within the experiencer group is that, you know, there, once experiencers start to get in a situation where they don't feel so much stigma, where they can talk about their experiences, where we can start comparing notes, you know, um, a, that that kind of situation seems to ex, like extremely intimidate um, fakes uh, or frauds, to be honest with you. And if you've got a hundred like really solid experiencers, if somebody walks in with a big with a story that's not entirely accurate, like they tend to see themselves right out the door, which is amazing. And I don't think that we're quite in that kind of signal to noise ratio on a place like Twitter, right? And in the general, in general on the internet, but just the fact that experiencers are able to, to kind of supersede or get, get past and put their head above water past the level of stigma in certain private situations. Now it's starting to help this, this because as as these coalescing groups get together um it it does seem to kind of provide a signal to noise sweet from the shaft kind of situation which is frankly amazing um and so you know there have been times within within the experiencer group that someone someone comes in new and they're 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 coming in hot and they're they portray themselves as knowing all the answers and Oftentimes those people are gone by the end of the week. Um, and it's not because of anything we're doing. It's because like the rest of the community generally recognizes that even at our best, you know, nobody has the perfect answers to anything. Right. And so that kind of prophecy, those kinds of profits, you know, one sad thing about this is that everybody has their own way of processing trauma. Right. And in, in so many situations, these, you know, you're both experiencers and depending on the, like what kind of contact you had, how that, what time, what time of your life that was like where you were at at that point, it can be more or less traumatic. Right. And, and so people have their own ways of processing this trauma. And so sometimes when people, when I see people online and they're like coming down, like they got stone tablets from God himself (laughs) with this stuff, like, like I, I kind of get it because even that person may have had an honest to God, you know, honest contact experience and they just processed it in their own way. 
where, where they need to kind of take the reins. You know what I mean? And I think that that kind of feeds back into something else that we're not, we haven't, that haven't, that we haven't really touched on quite yet, but I think is an important part of the community, which is that, that we often, when we're talking about our level of frustration with some greater intelligence, possibly some other possibly perceived superior intelligence, and it doesn't talk back to us in a way that is like above board and public and perceivable. It's easy to conflate that with the kind of existential problems that we would have where people um, maybe don't allow themselves to get mad at their God. They don't get to, they don't get to be frustrated within their religion. And so there are these uncomfortable overlaps within very, very, within people often it, it can be across the board. Right. And this isn't a problem of woo. It's not a problem of nuts and bolts. It's a problem of being able to, express yourself and being able to take ownership of like, what is my subconscious doing? Like, what is the shadow side of my consciousness? Like, how do I explore that? And am I getting mad at something that, you know, that is just part of the existential dilemma of not knowing of trying to speak to an intelligence that doesn't talk back. Does that make sense? Like just that can have its own level of frustration and stigma that doesn't, that actually clouds the, the, the process of, of elucidation in a way, because we, 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 instead of like sitting and looking at different types of intelligences, um, people are getting hung up at the point where there's a taboo of not, of not in, allowing or not allowing or misidentifying where their frustration should be for their own existential problems. Does that make sense? Yep. Excellent. Um, Excellent. Thank you for that. So we're just going to close it out now and I'm going to allow both of you to share your um, social media addresses. I'll start with you, James Iandoli. Where can people find your work? Yeah, people can find me on YouTube at Engaging the Phenomenon or on Twitter at Engaging the, which for Engaging the Phenomenon. If you type in Engaging the Phenomenon on Spotify, it'll come up. Uh, I also have another project called Meta Perspective. Um, so yeah, you, if Google engaging the phenomenon or even James Iandoli these days, and you're going to find me. How about you, Jay King? Well, first of all, I got to say, uh, James's new project meta perspective is super cool. And, uh, I love all of your work and I'm super happy to be here today. Uh, thanks for the invite. Um, but, uh, you can find, uh, www.theexperiencergroup.com. If you've ever had any contact situations, any anomalous experiences, we've got a great community of people that are, that are caring, that are smart, that are thoughtful, and it's a great place to compare notes. Uh, you can also find me uh, on Twitter and the Experiencer Group at, at F-O-R Experiencers, at for Experiencers. Um, and I highly encourage any, any, any experiencers out there to do so. Um, uh, we'd love to have you. All right. Thank you, James Iandoli, Jay King, and for coming today and offering your unique and well-developed perspectives. And um, that's it. And we're out. I hope you enjoyed that 90-minute UAP powwow as much as I did. And if you beg me to do more of these, I might just listen. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel where I'm covering UAP news and philosophy and posting regularly. And if you'd like to support this channel, you can check out my merch shop where I sell t-shirts. You become a patron, you could become a YouTube member, you could give me a one-time donation. All of those possibilities are in the links below. Or you could just slap a like on this bad boy and I'd appreciate it so much. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Special thanks to all YouTube members, patrons, those who have bought merch, those that have given me a one-time donation. I couldn't do without you. Thank you so much.